All right, welcome everyone. I know we've got lots to cover today um, and we'll want to, to take full use of the, the time together that we have. Um, so let's get started. Um, for those of you that have just joined us in the last couple of minutes, um, please note that we do have simultaneous translation available uh, for today's session. Um, thanks to Interpranet, uh, you have a couple of options. You can either join through your web browser or there is a dedicated app. Those instructions are in the email that you would have received prior to joining. Uh, the token that you will enter for today's conversation is radar coverage all as one word, um, and you can then select uh, the language of your choice. Um, and uh, if you have any questions or any challenges with that, uh, please contact my colleague, Tina LaRochelle, uh, tech support for today's session. So with that, let's get started. Welcome, everybody. Uh, today is the first in a series of four sessions uh, that CanWatch is so excited to be uh, delivering today together with our colleagues uh, from the Johns Hopkins at University radar project. I, I hope that's the right the right term for all of you. Um, but uh, this is, you know, uh, to get we've worked together in the past uh, to be able to provide some uh, learning opportunities uh, uh, around the radar suite of tools. This is the first time, though, that we're doing it fully virtually. Um, so lots of uh, exciting learning opportunities here. But I think what's so great um, is that when we've done these in, in person, obviously, we've been somewhat limited in the, the geographic area that could participate. And so to be able to have uh, partners from all across Canada joining us uh, for these training sessions um, in, in both languages is really uh, fantastic. And I think will really make for some rich discussion. So we're really grateful to be able to, to offer this and look forward to getting feedback from all of you participating um, uh, today. Uh, so just a couple of, of notes, some of you will be participating in all of the sessions um, over the next four weeks. Some of you will only be participating in, in this one or in others. Um, but please note that these sessions are being recorded, so they will be available uh, for you and for your colleagues to be able to access later and learn from later. And that's something we're really excited about. Um, in order to make the most of that, and because these are participatory sessions, um, that means um, that uh, if at any point you do come off mute or you're speaking at any point, um, your name may show up um, in the training uh, that we offer. So if that's something that you'd like to not happen um, and you'd like to rename yourself, um, everybody here should have the option to do so. So if you go up into the top right hand corner of your screen, you should see three dots like a little ellipses. If you click on that, it should give you the option to rename yourself um, and you're welcome to, to use whatever name you'd like to use or to use your organization name if you'd like to be identified as such. Um, and uh, so that way we can uh, keep um, a bit of control over uh, how people are, are named. Um, and uh, of course, uh, we invite you uh, to, to keep your camera off um, if, uh, if that's something that you'd prefer. Um, you can ask questions out loud throughout the session, um, but you can also write them directly in the chat box. Um, and we will uh, make sure that uh, we let the presenters uh, know about that question and they can answer it in, in the language in which it is asked. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my colleague Tina LaRochelle, her, she's been renamed to Tina LaRochelle Technical Support. She's here at any time if you are struggling to connect if you uh, need any uh, assistance with um, asking your question, coming on or off mute, um, she can help you with that. Feel free to um, ask her directly. Um, and as well, other members of the CanWatch team are here. Uh, we will be making all of the sessions available after the four sessions are completed, and we've had a chance to uh, edit all of the videos in both languages. So it It'll take a couple of weeks after the session, but if you have registered for today, um, you will get an email uh, letting you know when all of those sessions are available. Um, so uh, with that, uh, let's get started. I'm going to be turning it over to Melinda. Uh, just before I do, uh, I've put the URL, uh, an updated URL here on the screen um, for those of you who might want to reference it. 
uh, radar-project.org slash coverage dash survey. Uh, if you'd like to uh, log in there to see um, the coverage survey portion uh, for the rest of today. So with that, uh, Melinda, over to you. Okay. Thanks very much, Jessica. And hi, everyone. Um, very excited to see the level of interest in this workshop. So as, as uh, Jessica said, this is the first of four workshops on the uh, radar coverage tool. Um, as you'll hear, we've been working on this tool, um, or really the suite of tools for, for a while now. Um, and we've had several in-person workshops, but we're excited to be able to share the sort of near final version um, of these tools and to get all of your input. This, um, this is the most, of the four workshops, this is the one that's more of an overview and the others will get into uh, more detail on specific um, aspects of the tools as we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, maybe just to present myself, uh, to introduce myself uh, briefly, my name is Melinda Munoz. I am an assistant professor at uh, the Johns Hopkins uh, School of Public Health. Um, and I focus on um, program evaluation and measurement um, uh, particularly in, in low-income countries, particularly in Francophone Africa. Um, and I'm here today with um, a few of my colleagues, Talata Sawadugo luis um, and uh, Abdullahi Maiga, who I'll, I'll um, let introduce themselves in a moment. Um, but first, uh, we're really pleased that I think there's a few people from Global Affairs Canada who are able to be on this webinar today. and. Um, so I wanted to hand things over to, um, to Dave Weaver um, to uh, say a few words. So Dave, over to you. Uh, thanks, Melinda. Thanks, Jessica. <clears throat> so I'm Dave Weaver. I am Deputy Director for what we call Strategy and Coordination in our Global Health Team at Global Affairs Canada. Um, and we have been working with JHU since, uh, I guess, about 2016. Um, and, you know, this was a partnership launched under Canada's second MNCH initiative. Um, and it was really about developing some tools to improve accountability for, for that initiative, for MNCH. So by accountability, we're talking about, I mean, it can mean a few things, but it's really our ability to say if a project achieved what it said it was going to achieve. You know, did it reduce mortality, did it reduce maternal mortality, child mortality, did it change behavior? Um, so that was the, the origins of it. And there were several tools that were developed by, by Melinda and others at JHU and her team. Um, so fast forward to today, and we're now looking to use those tools that were developed to, um, to support accountability for the 10-year commitment to global health that was announced by Prime Minister Trudeau last year in 2019 and uh, officially started uh, as, of, as of last month. Um, so within, within GAC and with a few partners, including uh, with CanWatch and organized through CanWatch, we've been thinking about what an accountability framework uh, looks like for, for the 10-year commitment. Um, and I think part of it is really being able to tell a compelling story around overall overall results. You know, I, I don't think I'm being too um, pointed when I say I think it's, it's generally acknowledged that the, as a sector, the, the Canadian health sector feels like we could do a better job of, of telling that results story. I think we're pretty good on a project level, but kind of bringing it together overall. Um, I think we could be telling a, a more compelling, more impactful story. And so that's what we're hoping to do for the 10-year commitment. So what we're working on at GAC is uh, an accountability plan that, that will hopefully tell us, um, allow us to tell that, that, better, that better results story. And part of it is looking at baseline and endline data. And so that's where this webinar comes in and this um, tool comes in. Uh, the coverage survey tool, um, we just, we hope to get better, more consistent and robust data that we can actually use to tell that overall story. Um, so to that end, we, we really want to promote the use of this tool. Um, so it's great that this session is being organized. We hope to, to organize more of these for, for other partners. I think this session is completely, is, is fully subscribed. So that's great. Uh, it's nice to see so many people taking part. 
Um, and I'm excited that Melinda and her team are, are here to provide it. So thanks also to Jessica and her team at Canon Watch for organizing it. Um, so far, this, uh, this looks pretty good, and I'm already learning things about Zoom that I hadn't known before. So, uh, so thank you, Jessica. Um, I might also add, since, since I'm here, um, that as of March 31st, we, in fact, completed the, the MNCH commitments, as well as the three-year Her Voice, Her Choice a commitment for SRHR. Um, March 31st, they ended. We successfully completed those. We had planned a sort of celebration of, of those commitments, uh, of their completion, but with the advent of COVID, uh, we didn't really feel it was the, the appropriate moment to, to celebrate that. But um, I think I would just offer my congratulations to, to your organizations. Many, many of you will have um, done projects that were part of those initiatives. So um, congratulations for your contributions and, and the impacts that you had through those, through those projects. Um, so Melinda and Jessica, back to you. Okay. Great, thanks very much, Dave. Um, and we're, we're um, excited and hopeful that, that these tools will be useful for um, accountability going forward. Um, Talata and Maiga, I wanted to ask if you could introduce yourselves uh, briefly since we'll be hearing from you later on the webinar. Sure, um, so my name is Talata Savadugurovic. I am a research associate um, at Johns Hopkins University, um, and I work on many different of the tools within the radar project. Great, and Maiga? Okay, uh, hi everybody, everyone. I, I'm uh, Abdullah uh, Maiga. I'm a scientist uh, at the School of Public Health at the Johns Hopkins University. So I'm also part of uh, the RADAR team uh, with uh, Melinda and uh, Talata. And I will be uh, facilitating uh, forthcoming uh, sessions uh, as part of uh, these webinars. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you both. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so the objectives of today's webinar, as I said, this, this one, um, the other webinars that we will do um, are a little bit more hands-on and have a, have a bit more um, sort of technical training. This one, the objectives are really to present the radar coverage toolkit as well as the capacity building materials and to obtain feedback um, on that toolkit and, and on those materials. Um, so uh, we've, we've started already with um, introductions, um, talking about the objectives. Um, so next, uh, we will give an overview of the um, coverage survey toolkit, and I'll explain why we're calling it a toolkit. Um, we'll have some questions and discussion about, um, about the toolkit. Um, we'll present or provide a brief overview of the capacity building materials um, with time for some uh, questions and discussion on those. And then uh, we'll break into small groups for a discussion of coverage survey implementation. Um, and we, for this particular session, uh, we thought a lot about sort of what, what would make sense. And as you'll see, we're going to be presenting you um, a lot of information um, and a lot of different tools. And we thought that might be too much to integrate and expect people to give us immediate um, detailed feedback. So we will also be following up with a Google survey after the call. But we thought one way we could use these small group discussions was to hear from you all about your experience implementing household surveys, because we know many of you have, um, using, uh, uh, using coverage, uh, using this tool or other coverage survey tools, um, and different barriers or facilitators to conducting surveys. Um, so, uh, but first, um, before, we, before I get started on the, um, uh, the presentation, I also, we had a couple questions, poll questions that we wanted you to uh, complete um, so that we could get an idea of the audience for this um, webinar. So I think if you click on the poll button, you should see those questions. Um, and you should be able to, uh, to give your answers. Okay, so I think it looks like most uh, people have voted. Um, I'm not, I am able to see the results. I'm not sure if you all are. Um, 
so it looks like the um the okay it looks like everybody can see them now so um the majority of participants are from ngos with a few from academic institutions and and a few funders as well um and a good split between people involved in program implementation and m and &E. um and um yeah a, a good mix of familiarity with coverage surveys so some folks who've who've participated in implementation and or data analysis but also um, a, a good number with with um, relatively minimal familiarity um, okay i'm happy to see that that some of you all have used the um, some of the the coverage tools um, but many of you haven't okay Great. Um, so, so that's helpful to me, and we'll um, to keep in mind as we as we go through these slides. Okay. So maybe to get started, um, just to give a brief um, overview of the Radar project, um, which Radar stands for Real Accountability Data and Analysis for Results. It's a mouthful, so we just say Radar. Um, and the aim of the project is to support pro project design. Um, monitoring and evaluation to ultimately improve accountability. Um, so we do this by developing tools um, that can be used to basically for accountability to improve program and country accountability for MNCH and N and adolescent health and sexual and reproductive health. Um, to building a cadre of radar tool experts in Canada and elsewhere. Um, trying to innovate where we can to improve the usability um, of the tools and um, we uh, want to well we are making the full set of tools and all supporting materials open access um, so this is just to say that there are actually a number of different tools the coverage survey is only one of them um, i believe the um, life save tool and impact models have already had um, work various workshops and webinars um, and there will be uh, webinars um, in the next couple of months for quality of care and implementation strengths. Um, so the coverage survey tool, this, is, this slide sort of shows our conceptualization of uh, some of the questions that we would like to answer about programs um, for uh, accountability. And the coverage survey tool sort of answers question four, which is, um, are women and children and men and uh, other, other um, populations uh, who are in need of interventions actually, are they actually receiving them? Um, so uh, maybe to start with, I just wanted to, to go back to definitions and give the definition of intervention coverage so we're all on the same page. So when, when I talk about intervention coverage, I'm talking about um, the proportion of individuals in need of a service or intervention who actually receive that service or intervention. Um, and the reason we, um, we care about coverage so much and we talk about it so much in monitoring and evaluation is that it is a precursor to impact and it's also a lot easier to measure um, than many impact measures. Um, so if if women and children um, and adolescents and you know whatever your population of interest if if the people who need interventions are not receiving them there's really no way to get to impact um, and um, and so um, measuring intervention coverage is um, is really critical to understanding um, whether your program is likely to get to impact and also to be able to measure to model impact um, coverage indicators, coverage measures require population-based measurement. So what I mean by that is um, it requires you to actually go talk to people, um, to households in the population. You can't, um, it's difficult to get measures of coverage from say health facility data because um, with health facility data, you're only seeing part of the picture, right? You're only seeing people who come to the health facility for services. And um, with intervention coverage, we want to get a picture of the entire population. So many people in need may not come to the health facility, um, and so they would not be counted in facility-based measures of coverage. Um, uh, just as an aside, um, there are facility-based measures of coverage. Uh, many countries um, use HMIS data to estimate coverage. Um, I won't get into how, but, um, but population-based measurement is is the gold standard um, and is the way to ensure that that your interventions are getting to the people who need them okay 
Um, so when we were putting together this coverage survey tool, we have tried to um, follow a couple of guiding principles. Um, the first is to measure um, uh, Global Affairs Canada's core coverage indicators. So this was a set of indicators that I think was shared with us maybe in 2016 or 2017. Um, I think it may have changed since then, but that was kind of our starting point for putting together the questionnaires. Um, it's also, the questionnaires have been expanded to address women's empowerment, gender, sexual and reproductive health, as those have become um, priorities for Global Affairs Canada. Um, we've also included some additional indicators based on all of your feedback. Um, so um, uh, we, have, um, we have tried to keep this survey as light as possible to make it easier to implement, but also recognize that there are a number of, um, of priority indicators that are of interest to all of the, the partners as well as Global Affairs Canada and trying to make sure that those are included. Um, we have used standard valid questions to the extent possible. So if you look at our questionnaires, um, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a minute, they look a, a lot like DHS in mix, but just a lot lighter, right? Um, uh, a lot smaller. And that's because um, there's been a lot of experience with measuring intervention coverage for um, 30 some years now. Um, lots of experience testing different questions. Certain questions have been validated. And so we don't want to reinvent the wheel or be putting in questions that aren't comparable with standard surveys um, or with other, with other measures. Um, so using standard uh, questions was a priority. Um, we also wanted to remain flexible um, in order to address your needs. So we've tried to construct this, um, the questionnaire in a way that is modular, that is easy to adapt uh, for your program's needs. Um, and then also, uh, because the Life Saved tool, which some of you may have heard of, it's a, a modeling tool to use uh, coverage uh, change to model impact. Um, because that is a um, key radar tool, we have structured the coverage survey tool to be compatible with the Life Saved tool. So you should be able to use the outputs from uh, this uh, coverage survey to model uh, changes in mortality, in um, uh, nutritional status, and in other outcomes. Um, but also, as we were uh, working with, with uh, some of you all and holding workshops early on in this process, we recognized that um, planning and implementation challenges for household surveys were one of the key barriers to getting high quality household survey data. Household surveys are um, they are expensive, they're time consuming, they're logistically very complex um, to do well. And we, we heard from a lot of you that this was a barrier. And so um, we have prioritized developing a suite of materials um, to try and make this a little bit easier. Um, so that's why we, we refer to this as a toolkit and not just a tool because it's not just the questionnaires, it's, it's a whole lot of um, tools around the questionnaires. Um, so what we did is we sort of, um, outlined the process of conducting a household survey, um, which you can see here in blue, right? So there's, there's some planning that happens up front, um, figuring out what your objectives are, what indicators you wanna measure, um, what sample size you need, uh, sampling, doing your logistics planning, training every, all your data collectors, um, collecting your data, analyzing your data, managing your data throughout. And we, um, we tried to develop a set of tools that would address um, these different aspects of um, the survey process. Um, we're not claiming that this is exhaustive. I think we had um, you know, ideas for probably 20 other tools that, that could have been developed, but that we didn't have you know, sort of the time to develop or that wouldn't have been sort of realistic or, or um, easily adaptable. Uh, by partners, but but we've tried to sort of hit what we thought were the major needs and, and tools that um, uh, that we thought would be usable and adaptable by partners. Um, so I'll just note that um, several of these will be discussed in in the other three um, webinars. So next week we'll talk about the radar question and o questionnaire and ODK um, and some of the analytical tools um, that we have uh, on. June 2nd, we'll talk about gender analysis. Um, we have a gender expert that's been working with our team um, that's been doing some 
some interesting work developing guidelines for gender analysis using um, this tool. And then uh, on June 9th, um, we will uh, talk about sample size calculation, the tools for sample size calculation and for sampling. And I just want to note, um, I think Jessica said this as well, and uh, to lot to put it in the chat box, but uh, we do have a website um, that has a, a page for the coverage survey. Um, and all of the tools are on the website or for those that aren't uh, yet uh, ready to be shared, they will be made available on that website. So um, please do use that as your, your resource for, um, for uh, downloading these tools. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to switch over to talk about the radar questionnaire. Um, but actually, before I do that, um, we, I, I want to say something about ex using existing coverage data because um, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't. So um, because as I've mentioned, uh, household surveys are so um, time and resource intensive to implement um, and because there is a significant burden on the study population, um, using existing data is always the first choice. Um, and, and in some settings, there are a lot of existing data. Some countries have lots of you know, DHSs and mix and other surveys um, that are of high quality. Um, but uh, some countries don't have existing data. Sometimes existing data will not meet your needs. Um, and those are the cases where you need to conduct your own survey. Um, and so we've put a little decision tree here. Um, I'm not going to go through these in detail, but these are some of the considerations that, that you would want to think about when you're thinking about, am I able to use existing data um, for, uh, you know, for my, for whatever it is that I'm trying to do um, for my evaluation or whatnot, um, uh, or to imp inform my program design. Um, and uh, if, if all of these conditions are fulfilled, if you have the indicators of interest, um, they're available for the time period of interest in the population that you're interested in with sufficient sample size um, and with good quality and the data are available to you, then this is when you can consider using existing data. Um, but as I said, in many cases, that's not the case. And so um, our focus has been, um, or our, our remit as we understood it has been to develop tools um, for, for cases where you do need to conduct your own surveys. Um, so this is the questionnaire um, content. As I mentioned, we've tried to use standard indicators and questions where possible. Um, for those of you who are familiar with DHS and MIX, we used um, a MIX structure with a separate child questionnaire. Um, the, there's a couple reasons for that. One is just that it's um, more, it's easier to adapt than the DHS structure. So if you're not um, working in child health and you don't need to measure uh, child health indicators, you can easily drop the child questionnaire with no impact to the rest of the questionnaires. Um, it also allows for the inclusion of um, children whose biological mothers aren't living in the household, which is different than DHS. Um, and it doesn't require a full birth history, um, again, unlike the DHS. So, um, uh, so that's why we have the structure. Um, but the results from this um, should be, are comparable to DHS and mix. And as I mentioned, can be inputted into list for modeling impact. So we do have four questionnaires, um, a household questionnaire um, with, with um, a household listing to identify uh, household members who are eligible to respond to the, um, the three individual questionnaires, the women's, man's, and child questionnaire, um, questions on household assets to look at wealth, um, and then a number of, um, of other uh, household level indicators. A woman's questionnaire that includes um, our questions about um, sexual and reproductive health, antenatal care, childbirth, postnatal care, um, and, um, and work and decision making. So these are um, some of our, our um, women's empowerment or gender questions. A man's questionnaire, which is um, also includes some, some uh, information on family planning, work and decision making, and can also contributes to gender analyses. Um, and then a child questionnaire with a number of child indicators. So these questionnaires are available in English, French, and Swahili um, in both paper and, um, and ODK. Um, 
this is a screenshot of, uh, just to show you, this is uh, a very long list, so you can't see it all here, but um, that some of the indicators that can be measured using these questionnaires, and we have mapped them to different initiatives. So you can see that um, some of them uh, are, are these uh, priority um, uh, GAC indicators that uh, were shared with us early on. Some of them are SDG indicators, and a number are from other um, initiatives. Um, and I did want to note that we have um, a resource that we've called Indicator Sheets. It is um, up on the website. Um, and basically for each indicator that is measured in the radar tool, um, the indicator sheet presents the indicator definition, the numerator and denominator, um, questions that contribute to the numerator and denominator, and then some notes on indicator calculation. So the intent here is to make it easier for you all to adapt the questionnaire and to determine uh, which questions you need to include for your indicators of interest, um, and also to help you, um, you know, in the in the data analysis phase. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Talata now to talk about the rest of the toolkit. Thanks, Melinda. Um, could you please unshare your screen and I'll share mine? Oh, sure. Thanks. Excellent. Perfect. So as Melinda um, was mentioning, what we have uh, developed is a large toolkit um, kind of covering everything from survey design um, all the way through data analysis. Um, so there are some guiding principles for all of the pieces of the toolkit that I'm going to present um, um, in the next couple of slides, um, which is they're all by design meant to be uh, ready to use by partners um, who might want to pick up the material and adapt them for their survey. So we're going to start with preparing um, for the survey. Uh, we've developed a sample size calculator to help people kind of think through what kind of sample size they're looking at when they make the decision to include different indicators. Um, so the, it's an online application that is uh, nearly final at this point. I don't even think you can call it a beta anymore. Um, and what it does is it essentially, as I said, walks you through um, the sample size considerations um, for all of the different uh, indicators that you might want to select. Um, it's highly customizable um, and it's available uh, through our website as well, um, this very advanced beta version. Um, we'll go into more depth about this uh, on the June 9th webinar. There's also a timeline template. So um, what we've gone through is given essentially a broad guidelines on how long each of the activities um, might take um, for just as guidance. Um, once again, it's highly adaptable. So depending on what kind of survey you're looking at, how big it is, how many regions you're covering, um, you can adapt this template um, to your needs. Um, it is very handy to have um, these elements kind of listed out because um, oftentimes things early on, such as contract negotiations or ethical clearance, aren't necessarily calculated in the timeline. Um, and that can cause some problems when you're um, setting dates for your deliverables um, and you forget these early pieces. So that template is available for download online. Uh, we also have a supply calculator. Once again, um, the main advantage of this is having everything that you could possibly need um, listed out. Um, and it's easy for you then to go through it and include um, how many of each item you'll need. Once again, it's helpful um, for making sure that you don't forget anything. Um, it will self-populate also based on how many teams you, you put in, um, how many people per team. Etc. It populates directly into the second page um, of the sample size calculator or the supply calculator. Um, it's designed also to be compatible with the budget template. So the first step will be to calculate how many 
supplies you need and what quantity you're, you're looking at. And then you can easily copy paste that into the, the budget template and um, just go through, put in how much each item costs. It's pretty straightforward. Um, but once again, what we've done here is made it uh, very thorough and very comprehensive. Um, so anybody who is maybe not as familiar with coverage surveys um, can really take a look at every little thing down to the pens you might need, down to um, boards or all of the things that you need to think about when you're looking to implement a high quality coverage survey. We also have a documentation template. Um, in our experience, documentation is, is incredibly important and often gets overlooked. Um, and documentation has to be ongoing from the very beginning um, all the way to the very end of the survey. It's helpful for tracing back um, what happened, what were the decisions that were made, um, why they were made, et cetera. So the documentation template essentially just provides um, a, a place where all of those issues can be uh, recorded as you go along in case anything happens down the line and you want to refer back, um, we have this resource as well. Um, we have um, an Excel spreadsheet that also is to be used um, to sample the households. So um, the other one was a sample size calculator for calculating um, the sample size in terms of, of um, people. This is uh, looking at sampling the households. Um, we are working on developing a desktop application. Right now, uh, this sample, uh, the cluster sampling um, for sampling households is available as an Excel sheet, but um, we will have a desktop application to help folks um, become more familiar with this available in June 2020. Moving on to what is necessary for the field work, um, we have a template also for uh, a generic deployment plan. The first tab has some guidance and some information on, on what you need to think through when you're developing a deployment plan. Um, the second tab actually has uh, the, the template itself, uh, so you can go through and enter all the information. Um, it's formatted so that it can be printed out if you want to send it out into the field with your data collectors or if you're using tablets, um, you can save them as PDFs for easy referral on the tablets themselves. Um, we didn't go, we didn't list them out one by one here, um, but we do have a pretty comprehensive set of tools um, for mapping. So mapping, um, since I remember from the poll, some of you might not be very familiar um, with coverage surveys. Mapping is, is the preliminary step um, to create essentially um, your sampling frame from which you will select your, your households. Um, so we have this complete set of tools um, going from training, uh, training agendas, uh, deployment plan, um, and we also have some data quality assurance um, indicators that we can look at um, for mapping as well. Um, this is a, a for the actual data collectors themselves. Um, once again, not going through them one by one, um, but it's essentially everything you would, might need to carry out a data collector training um, prior to your survey. Uh, we'll go into a little bit more detail later in the presentation, um, but essentially goes from interviewer manuals, team leader manuals, uh, an agenda, um, some data quality assurance um, items. There's also presentations that are ready, um, and the manuals are available in both English and French. Um, our questionnaire is set up um, to work with uh, the ODK system. So we chose ODK for um, a number of reasons. One, it's very easy to use, it's um, free, um, and it doesn't require a lot of training to be able to modify the, the questionnaire. Um, so this will be covered uh, a little bit more in depth in a future webinar, but um, the CAPI system um, portrayed here, or displayed here, um, what we've developed 
is around this section here. So we have um, the ODK questionnaire in XMLS in XLS form um, ready for upload. We have the comprehensive uh, questionnaire, including all of the things that Melinda talked about at the very beginning um, with the woman, man, uh, household, and child questionnaire. Um, and the way you'll see it, it's quite colorful um, and the, the color coding makes it easy to add um, and remove modules or questions, indicators, um, although we do um, encourage a lot of caution when doing so. Uh, the final edited versions will be available in June 2020, um, but it exists in both uh, English and French. Um, as I mentioned, also, we have um, tools all the way down to data analysis. So we have some analysis scripts. Um, our questionnaire is, uh, has certain variable names, so we encourage any modification made to the questionnaire um, to adapt to your needs. Uh, it's very important to keep the question numbers the same. But provided that the question numbers remain the same, we have analysis scripts that are designed to run on um, the, the questionnaire um, as we provide it in, publicly. Uh, once again, this is something that will be covered in more depth on the May 26th webinar. And Melinda touched uh, on it already a little bit. Uh, we have developed a comprehensive guidance document uh, on how to carry out gender sensitive analyses using coverage survey data. Um, it is particularly, it is designed to be used um, with the radar questionnaire, but um, there's some uh, guidance that is applicable for coverage surveys in general as well. Um, as we mentioned on the June 2nd uh, webinar, uh, the team will go into a lot more depth Um, and I wanted to pause here and see now that we've um, covered quite a bit uh, about what is available in terms of tools, um, the bigger pieces, the smaller pieces, if there were any questions, any comments or suggestions um, that participants might have at this point and want to share with us. So I think if, if there's any questions, you could go ahead and, and uh, unmute yourselves um, or else uh, type your question in the chat box. Um, I was worried we might be over time, but in fact, we, we went a little bit faster than we expected. So we, we do have some time here. Um. Thank you, uh, Belinda and Talata. This is Louis Basel from Canadian Red Cross. Um, uh, we have used uh, the coverage survey in uh, our project in South Sudan uh, last year and lunch survey. It was a very successful exercise. Um, if you, but I think the issue here is that the, the sampling and then we will, we will talk about that in the, um, in the webinar that is coming. Uh, the cost of the survey is determined by the sample size or impacted very much by that. Could you give us an idea about a rough uh, budget when we do project planning of, let's say, three or four scenarios? If you do the whole survey for this much population, it will cost this much. If you do module one and two, it will cost that much, something like that as a guiding uh, uh, rule. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks, Louie. It's, it's great to hear that it went well in South Sudan, um, and it's a good question. So I, um, I will give a partial response, um, uh, probably not much of a response. I will say that um, this is something that actually um, Radar uh, more broadly has been working on. So we have somebody um, who has been collecting information on actual costs um, from a variety of different household surveys um, it conducted in different settings with different characteristics, right? So they do anthropometry or they don't do anthropometry, they measure mortality or they don't, so on. Um, and so the idea is to give an, a, you know, a data-based answer to that question because it's one that we get a lot and it is challenging to answer because there are so many variables. Um, so 
uh, country to country costs vary incredibly, right? I, I primarily work in, in West Africa and there, like, there's not a huge difference between, say, Mali and Burkina, but there is a huge difference with Tanzania or with Bangladesh, um, just how much things cost and how much people are paid. Um, whether there are in-kind contributions. So vehicles are one of the biggest costs. And so if your organization has vehicles that can be used, um, it will make your survey a lot cheaper. Um, you know, and then of course, as you mentioned uh, as well, which indicators are included, some things we know are more expensive, uh, such as anthropometry is expensive, you need equipment, you, people need special training, um, so your training needs to be longer, um, it takes more time in the field, mortality similarly um, is, is fairly expensive to measure and it's, it's not in our survey. Um, so, um, but it's, I, I, it's difficult to provide um, a um, precise answer to your question. I think the, um, the ballpark that we've been working with is if you wanted to implement um, uh, this survey, uh, you know, with good sampling, you know, with mapping and um, uh, probability sampling, uh, you'd be talking about, you know, maybe 250,000 um, for, for a uh, 2,000 household survey. Um, that's USD. So uh, you need to convert that to Canadian dollars. Um, and again, there's, as I mentioned, there's sort of a wide um, uncertainty range around that, depending on all those factors that I just mentioned. You, I'm sure you could certainly do it for less. Um, in some settings, potentially it could be more, uh, depending on what you want to do. Obviously, the bigger your sample size, the bigger your budget as well. Um, but but it, it really, um, uh, there there's so many variables that it is difficult um, to, to give a precise answer. Um, but this is one of the reasons also we, we did that budget template because I think our experience in working with folks is when, when you budget for a survey, a lot of times there's things that you just forget you're not thinking about um, uh, because, because they are so complex. Um, and so um, the idea behind the budget was to, to make sure that when you are budgeting out and trying to figure out you know, what you need to have budgeted for your baseline and end line, um, that you are taking all of those items into account. Um, Talata and Maiga, I don't know if you want to say anything uh, else in response to, to Louie's question. No, I think you did a great job um, covering it. Um, I think that sums up the struggle that we've had um, with that exact question. Um, I see that we had some other questions um, in the chat. Um, so just to pull one up. Um, we found it useful to ask women questions regarding attitudes around gender equality. However, in the radar survey, the attitude modules are only asked of men. Did I get that right? Would there be value in creating a similar module for women? Um, so just to clarify, in the radar coverage survey, um, the, the, the complete one um, is both men and women. Um, so we asked exactly the same questions um, around gender-related uh, attitudes, et cetera to both men um, and women. We'll talk about it a little bit more in the um, gender focus uh, webinar, which I think is the May 26th one. Um, it's where the June 2nd. Oh, thank you, yeah, one, one of the two. <laughs> um, uh, where uh, the folks who have led that piece of the work um, actually did some very thorough uh, looks into how the data differs between what is what men respond, what women respond, um, et cetera. So we'll talk about that a lot more um, later. Um, and then Melinda, there's also a second question um, saying, hello, we have also used the coverage survey in, with our project in Tanzania. However, one challenge we found difficult to navigate on our own was setting up the ODK and server as we don't have dedicated IT staff. We had to use your J RJ2 contacts to um, set this up for us. Will there be improved information guides for projects to internalize, internally set up the technical CAPI components? Um, Melinda, if you want to take that one. Sure. Um, I, will, I will try and also I would encourage you to, um, or somebody from your organization to participate in, in next week's webinar. Um, so yes, there is a, a guide that goes along with the ODK. Um, 
uh, tool. And actually, ODK has vastly improved their um, their online uh, help guide recently. So we scaled back. Our, we we had initially had a more comp we were developing a more comprehensive guide, and we found that ODK had updated theirs to address many of the things that we were putting in ours. So we have scaled ours back. But there is um, a guide that accompanies the ODK tool that covers some of this. Um, my understanding, I am not an IT person, but my understanding from our data manager is that um, is that uh, DigitalOceans, which is the um, the remote server that we use, has it's also become much easier to set up a server there. And actually, I'm not sure if Emily's on. Um, if she is, she can maybe comment on that. Um, yeah. yeah, I had seen her here, yeah. um, but I will yeah. turn my video off if that's okay. <laughs> sure. Uh, because I'm not quite ready for prime time. But but uh, Hannah, who asked this question, are, are you available next week at this time? If um if so, uh, yes. Sorry, yes, I am. Okay, so so we'll go into more detail then. But in sum, it's become possible with uh, between free free web services as well as um as well as DigitalOcean to set up one's own server. It's still, it's still probably the most difficult technical piece of the, of the computer assisted personal interview components, but um, we, will, we will go through that. And I can, I can make a note here to, to emphasize that and any other questions that come up around that during this session. Great, thank you. Thanks. Um, great. Thanks, Emily. Um, I just want to go back to the gender question for a second. I, I just to emphasize what what Talata said is I, it's possible that um, you were maybe looking at a version of the questionnaire that didn't include it might be an older version. I'm not sure um, the version on the website. I will double check should include a um, a work and decision making module. Uh, which includes those those attitude questions. Um, there's also a few in the ANC and childbirth modules specifically about attitudes towards men's involvement in, in ANC and, and delivery. Any other questions um, for either from folks who have who have used the tool um, and have sort of reactions to its usability um, or um, or things that you are not seeing that you wish you, you know, you could have um, we uh, as I mentioned, these are near final tools, but we do have um, uh, a little bit more time. And so I think if there are things that you're like, oh, you know, this having this would be super useful and I didn't see it in your list, that would be something that we could consider. Um, and you, as, as I think um, uh, Jessica mentioned, there'll be a Google survey at the end, um, available to you at the end to, to provide comments if you think of anything after the webinar. I think while people are pondering their questions, we can move forward with the presentation. Sure. Awesome. So let me get this back up. Okay. Um, so we wanted to talk in a bit more detail about the um, different capacity building materials and how we approach this. Um, so as, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, or in the last presentation, um, part of Radar's remit is, is sort of to build capacity or build a cadre of experts, um, uh, both in Canada and elsewhere. And so for the survey tool, um, we, we sort of thought about three audiences um, for this, each of which has different needs. Um, so first we have the field workers, right? The data collectors, the supervisors, um, the folks who are in the field collecting data, um, who, and their need is, is essentially, they need to know enough about um, the survey and how to implement it to be able to, to do their work and uh, provide collect good quality data. Um, 
uh, the next level, um, and this is probably the level that needs the most information, are the implementers. So this would be the survey manager, the data manager. If you are hiring a consultant to, um, to do your survey, uh, they would probably fall in this category. Um, and then we would also put m and &E, uh, generally in this category. So these are people who they need to know everything that the field workers know, right? Because they're the ones training the field workers and overseeing the field workers. But they also need a lot of technical knowledge about, um, about the tool, about, um, you know, uh, what sample size, you know, how big of a sample do we need? How do we sample? Why do we sample this way? Um, because uh, they are the ones, you know, planning the whole survey um, and dealing with issues in the field. And so you need to have fairly deep technical knowledge about these surveys in order to, to play that role. Um, and then the third level, um, I've written here individuals commissioning surveys, and I think, um, you know, this varies from organization to organization, but these are basically folks who are maybe um, on the program level or they are um, saying, you know, we deciding we need to do a survey, right? We need to do a baseline survey. We need to do an online survey for this reason, but they're not necessarily, they may be hiring the consultant um, uh, or the organization that does the survey, but they're not really the ones implementing the survey or analyzing the survey data. Um, so they also um, have some capacity building needs, but their, their needs are different, right? They may not need all of the technical details. They are not the ones necessarily doing a sample size calculation, um, but they do need to know something about, um, you know, what, um, what is needed to conduct a household survey. Um, as Lou, I mentioned, what kind of budget we're talking about, what kind of timeline we're talking about, um, you know, what um, and what are sort of the major components of, um, of survey uh, implementation and analysis. Okay, so then, um, so uh, just to go through the materials that we've developed then by these audiences. Um, so for field workers, um, as, as Talata presented uh, uh, a few minutes ago, we have um, different manuals and training materials. Um, for the survey implementers and m and &E staff, uh, we also have the manuals and training materials. So again, they need to be familiar with everything that is in, that is in those materials. Um, but we also have uh, what we're calling an implementation guide which is intended as sort of a soup to nuts guide of to, to pull together all of these disparate tools and help walk people through, you know, um, how, how they are to be implemented and from, you know, survey planning all the way through data analysis and data use. Um, and then we have uh, an online course. Um, so we'll talk in more detail about all of these um, in a few minutes. Um, then we have an online course. Um, that has sort of two versions. One is a more technical version and one is a less technical version. So we think the survey implementers and the m and &E staff um, uh, would uh, generally use the more technical version that does get into, you know, how do we estimate sample size? Um, how do we, you know, why do we weight data? Um, you know, how do we analyze these data? So it's some of these more, um, more uh, technical aspects of, of survey implementation and analysis. Um, and then for individuals commissioning surveys, we also think the implementation guide would be useful to them, although they might not uh, be reading it through um, from start to finish, but there may be certain sections, um, particularly around um, kind of planning for the survey and developing the survey objectives um, that would and, and using the data that would be particularly useful to them. And then the non-technical version of the online course that sort of gets into, um, you know, why do we do coverage surveys? Um, what kinds of things can they measure? What kinds of things can they not measure? Um, you know, uh, uh, things like that, um, that, that would be uh, useful to, to those folks. Okay, so Talata, now um, over to you to go uh, in more detail uh, on each of these uh, resources. Author, if you don't mind just handing me over the share screen. Yeah. Yep, there you go. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so 
what we're going to do now is to look in a little bit more detail um, about uh, into the different um, training materials and training resources that we have available. Um, in our experience, uh, the train the quality of training that data collectors receive um, is just so very important um, for obtaining high quality data. So we have a lot of things available. Um, the manuals uh, are adapted from the DHS and NICS manuals um, to fit our survey. Um, so you'll see as you flip through them, there's a lot of some similarities. Um, the training materials, such as the agenda and the slide set, those were actually developed specifically for our surveys. Um, and then both of those can be adapted uh, to your exact survey's need, needs. Um, so as we mentioned before, one of the guiding principles of developing this tool is to have a highly flexible tool. So everything in here um, will be um, adaptable for your survey. Um, we did want to kind of put some emphasis here about the fact that um, even though we have some slide sets and some training materials, et cetera, um, nothing replaces uh, the item by item review of the questionnaire um, with the support of the interviewer manual, which provides some context. Um, but we just want to take this opportunity to really um, emphasize that really getting to know the questionnaire um, very closely is, is key in any training um, for a coverage survey. So starting with the training agenda, it's, it's a pretty generic um, training agenda um, with some notes at the top and some guidance throughout. Um, it can easily be adapted to your specific needs. If you're training more people, um, add more time. If you're including certain um, specificities such as anthropometry or if you're training in multiple languages, um, the timing can, can be extended to include those other um, pieces as well. The slide sets that we have available, um, the first one um, actually we don't have available um, because the first piece um, that we would recommend would be focusing on your exact survey um, program partner information that is important for your data collectors um, to know and to be aware of um, as they start their, their training with you. Um, the second slide set goes into more of the training agenda, the contents, the manual, just kind of um, laying the base of what is available and how to use each uh, piece for the data collectors. Um, then there's another slide set for the roles and responsibilities of the survey staff, um, followed by using mapping materials for data collection, um, an overview of the coverage survey questionnaires, um, a piece on human subjects research ethics to make sure um, we're staying compliant with all of those requirements. And finally, um, pieces on survey supervision and quality assurance, mostly targeting um, team leaders or supervisors that will be involved in the data collection. The interviewer manual that we've mentioned previously, um, it's set up um, as, as on the slide, so introductions and guidelines for the actual interviewing um, skills, um, how to conduct an interview, um, some general field work procedure things, um, some recommendations for completing the questionnaire, and finally it goes um, into a question by question review of the questionnaire, providing context about each one of the questions, explaining why it's being asked, <clears throat> in some cases explaining why it's being asked in that particular way, um, and it's meant to serve um, as kind of a reference documents for the data collectors when they're in the field beyond training, um, although it should also be used during training, but it's, uh, it's really once the data collectors are on their own, they can refer to this very comprehensive document um, to answer most of the questions that might come up. Um, in addition to that um, data collector um, manual, there's also a team leader and or supervisor manual um, which is meant to be added on top. Um, so anybody in a team leader supervision kind of role should have um, followed, attended the training for a data collector and be very familiar with the, all of the resources for data collectors. But since their primary role will be as a team leader or in some sort of supervision um, role, 
Um, they have some additional things that they need to, to be mindful of, including um, around management, um, of field work, also of personnel, um, some data quality, um, re-interviews, um, kind of elements that are all detailed in, in the manual. We also, um, on that note, recommend that um, you add on an extra day, maybe an extra day and a half, um, to make sure that the folks that are selected uh, to be team leaders or supervisors have time to go over the materials and receive particular training um, for the role that they're going to actually play in the field. As Melinda mentioned, um, we have a draft of an implementation guide um, that we've been working on, um, and it's meant to really serve as kind of um, the document that ties all of these pieces together, kind of walking folks through from the very beginning um, all the way to the very end, um, you presenting the tools that we have available for each step of the survey. And so um, Melinda touched on this briefly as well. Um, we want to bring all of this information um, together in a way that can be helpful for partners. So um, we've presented in broad lines kind of all of the pieces of the toolkit that we have um, ready and, and that will be made available by June. Um, but there is also a big gap of knowledge that um, if you're not very familiar with coverage surveys, um, we were looking for a way to kind of communicate um, the knowledge that, that we think is important for anyone implementing a coverage survey and particularly for some for a team trying to implement the radar coverage survey. So we've developed a course um, that we are going to be making uh, available online through Coursera. It was originally scheduled for release in June 2020 um, because all filming has had to stop since February, I believe. Um, we are a little bit delayed on that timeline um, and we can't realistically give a firm timeline since everything is so up in the air at this point um, for the filming. Um, but the course, once it is um, ready and made available online, um, is going to be targeting um, kind of two tiers of audience uh, with a more technical um, audience that might be interested in the details Melinda mentioned, um, as well as some material that's more um, for general um, monitoring, evaluation, implementation of survey, um, things that folks who are not going to be involved with, for example, the data analysis, but who will be involved with leading implementation um, would need to know in order to, to do a, a good job and lead to high quality data. Um, we have set up the course. Um, it's a 28 hour um, course with some um, assessments along the way. Um, most of the course is through um, kind of didactic short videos. Um, with some vignettes of folks who have already implemented cover surveys, get their perspective, et cetera. It goes all the way from coverage concepts to how to design and plan for a survey, going into developing your tool, preparing for the field work, and then ending with the data management and the analysis um, of the data that you've collected. And I'm going to once again pause um, and kind of take stock here and see if we have any um, questions, comments, or suggestions at this point. Um, let's see if the chat has been active. Yes, thanks, Talata. So there are a number of questions uh, that have come up in the chat box. So maybe we can address those while um, people are thinking of their, their questions. OK, so we have a first question. Um, it appears that the survey does not include any questions related to abortion and there are no indicators related to abortion in the indicator list. Is this correct? Melinda. Yes, uh, yes, this is correct. So um, uh, collecting uh, information on abortion in household surveys or, or household population-based data collection in general is very difficult. 
um, both because of the stigma surrounding abortion and because of um, legal restrictions in many settings. Um, so there are specialized methods that have been developed to collect um, information on on abortions to try and but if you if you include questions on abortion in a survey like this, you will massively underestimate the prevalence. Um, one one thing that you um, could do, uh, I, I'm not sure if what you're interested in, if you're interested in provision of abortion services, that's something that could be included in a, um, a health facility assessment. Um, and as we mentioned, there, there's another um, uh, set of tools on implementation strength and, and quality of care. And so that that would be where you would want to um, take a look at that. But if it's if what you're interested in is is actually um, you know uh, the prevalence of abortions, unsafe abortions, um, safe abortions that uh, would not really be feasible to to put into a survey like this. It really needs its its um, own special uh, data collection. Um, yeah, we have some additional. Um, context here, I am a global abortion researcher and there are absolutely ways to collect these data. However, the decision to include questions is incredibly problematic and undermines the global efforts and efforts by the Canadian government to ensure that um, SRHR is comprehensive, um, referring specifically to the decision to silo abortion care. Yeah, so I, I agree 100% that there are ways to collect these data. I think the question is, can they be collected well and accurately in a survey like this? Um, and uh, I might ask Maiga actually to chime in because um, uh, a, a number of uh, some of the research um, trying to estimate the prevalence of abortion was actually um, done at, at his old institution. Um, but it, it is, um, we we need to walk up, uh, we need to consider sort of um, the risks um, to to the data and to the population. Um, so that's that's another issue that I don't want to get into too much, but we also decided against um, asking questions about whether women had experienced gender-based violence because those also require special precautions when you are implementing this type of survey um, to protect the, the health of those women and, um, and also the data that you're collecting to avoid putting participants at risk. Um, and, and that's challenging for many organizations to do. So Maiga, I, I don't know if you want to, um, to say anything about this. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Melinda. I mean that uh, you, you well address uh, these uh, questions. And um, some things uh, also we may need to uh, highlight uh, is that uh, where we were uh, uh, trying to create uh, a rather questionnaire, we're trying to align uh, on some core indicators. Uh, as a care indicators uh, that were relevant uh, for uh, uh, GAC and also Canadian partners. Uh, so uh, we try to have uh, a very uh, simple and streamlined questionnaire. So this is why uh, we didn't include uh, uh, some of uh, the questions like uh, uh, abortions. Uh, so for sure, uh, there is uh, absolutely a way also to collect uh, this data uh, from uh, such uh, uh, um, uh, we were such tools, uh, so uh, this is something so that is doable. But uh, we wanted to have something so uh, uh, light, okay, or uh, to be able to provide uh, some indicators uh, uh, that are useful for some key interventions uh, uh, performed uh, as part of a uh, uh, work done by Canadian partners. Yeah, over. Thanks, Maya. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, and we have another question here. Um, this type of survey is supposed to bridge the existing gap between routine data, for example, um, HMIS, and data from regular surveys, for example, CHS. How best does one strike an optimal balance between generating real-time data and regularity of the survey? That is a great question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um... So I, I think it, it is a really important question as to when do you do these surveys um, uh, and for what purpose. Um, 
part of the reason I think we were asked to develop this tool was because many organizations were being asked to do baseline and endline surveys. And so certainly if you are evaluating, trying to evaluate um, the effect of your program and uh, their, um, uh, you, you want to look at the effect of your program on coverage indicators um, and there are no um, you know, other surveys that you could use such as a DHS or a mix, uh, you, you would um, want to, to conduct a survey like this. Um, uh, I, but the, the challenge I think as you are alluding to in your question, I'm just rereading it again to make sure I'm answering it is um, is that these surveys take a lot of time. And so you are reporting on things, um, you know, maybe six months after the fact or for um, maternal and newborn health indicators a couple years after the fact because it's a, it's a several year reference period. Um, so I don't, uh, it, it is so, this is something that you need to balance sort of depending on your needs. For, for evaluation purposes, um, it's usually not a huge deal, right, that you can maybe only do two surveys in the course of your program and, and they're, you're getting the data a bit delayed. Um, you can still estimate program impact and that's fine. But in terms of the program, right, to feed back into your program, this is where um, you, uh, you would um, maybe want more timely data. And so the ideal, I think, is some combination of these where um, you, you just you need to think about for what purpose um, and, uh, and how timely you need those data to be, and also what's available to you, right? So if you have estimates of ANC um, utilization or coverage that are coming out from the, the HMIS, um, you're able to get access to those. They seem to be reasonable. Um, you know, you may be able to use those or your pro be able to use your program monitoring uh, data to, um, uh, to feed back to your program implementation, right, and to adjust your program implementation. Um, so it's not, it's not an either or, um, it, it is, uh, it's an and. But I, I do really um, want to emphasize that, that uh, these surveys are, are expensive, they're resource intensive, and so it's not something that you, um, you, you want to consider uh, what other data are available to you before you do one of these surveys. I'm not sure if that, that's answering your question. Um, and Melinda, I don't know if we confirmed this, forgive me if we did, uh, but there was another question, will the gender analysis document, uh, or is the gender analysis document available on the website, or will it be at any point? Uh, it is not on the website right now, but it will be um, in the coming month or so, so they're, they're working on it. Um, uh, maybe just about the, the timing of this. We, we didn't want to wait until all the tools were final to have these webinars because part of the purpose of these webinars was to get feedback, was to sort of get feedback from you and incorporate the feedback on these tools. Um, so, and then the, the pandemic has, has adjusted various timelines, of course. Um, and so, so this is why we're not presenting you with a final, final set of tools, um, but we are, um, uh, we are hoping to get to get your feedback and um, that document will be presented on the June 2nd webinar, I believe. Um, and, uh, and we would uh, really appreciate all of your your feedback after that. And but it should be up on the website um, in, the, in the next month or so. Excellent. All right. Um, so moving on um, from from this section, um, we are going to move to a discussion um, section. So in order to have a discussion with so many people, um, we've decided to use breakout rooms. Um, you have been pre-assigned to a breakout room based on um, your language preferences as, as well as um, your organization. And what we would like to do now is to have um, in within each one of the groups, um, the breakout rooms rather, to have discussion around um, some of these questions that we have up here and that we'll, I'll post in the chat um, shortly. Um, and as you go through talking through it, one of the moderators will also be in the room with you um, to try and take some, some notes uh, about what is being said at that point. 
Um, so I think Tina is going to help us um, move into the breakout rooms now. Yes, before we before we do that, just really quickly to make sure everyone knows how to go and come back, uh, since many people have used breakout rooms, um, but not everyone. Um, so you'll momentarily see a prompt to move you into that breakout room if you could accept that. Um, Tina will bring us back at, at the 20 minute mark. Um, but again, uh, please hit and accept as it'll bump you uh, over. We did our best, as Talata said, to assign uh, you in groups based on the language preferences that you gave. But depending on the email you used to log in uh, today, um, I may not have gotten it perfectly right. So uh, if for whatever reason um, you are in a one group and you'd like to be in a group communicating in a different language, if you could just message Tina directly in the chat um, and she'll make sure to move you over to the correct group. And one final note um, that this plenary is being recorded, but the individual group discussions um, are not. Um, so that's a space where uh, you can speak in it. Uh, in each of the groups, we have a moderator who will be sketching out some notes from that discussion. So with that, Tina, over to you. Oops, I'm on mute. Okay, there we go. Um, so yes, hi everybody, and um, uh, it was great to talk in groups, and I, I hope you all had good discussions. I want to maybe ask, um, uh, we, I don't think we have time for all of the groups to share a, a report out, but maybe if um, uh, one or maybe two of the groups want to uh, raise um, uh, some things that were uh, discussed in your group, um, that would be, uh, so what are some of the points that, that came up during, um, during your uh, discussion? Um, I'll say that something that came up actually at the end of our group's discussion that we did not um, have time to fully address was was a question about sort of monitoring data quality, um, both during and, and after a survey and how to assess the, the quality of the survey. Um, so that's something we, we didn't really mention here, but it um, we do have a um, uh, a, date, a list of data quality indicators um, to use to monitor during um, uh, the quality of your data, both during and after the survey. And we have tried um, several times in different ways to construct some kind of dashboards that, that people could use um, to report out on these indicators sort of in real time. But it is uh, challenging to construct something that, that will work for um, many different surveys that have been adapted in different ways. So, uh, right now, we do not have that as one of the tools, um, although it's something that we continue to sort of think about and, and try to figure out how we could do that. Um, so let me Maybe see. If I, it, I will yeah. go on to share what uh, my small group, uh, uh, some, some of the points very briefly. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of interest in unpacking the gender analysis and uh, hearing more about the women empowerment indicators that I included in the radar tools. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, also uh, what uh, all of the participants mentioned is that they do use uh, indicators uh, from the DHS, from MIX. Uh, some of them use their own tools that they have also adapted from MIX and DHS to conduct surveys. And uh, there's a lot of interest in having guidance on how, for example, with the um, a radar coverage survey uh, results, how if there could be some guidance on how can we triangulate those results with secondary data, secondary data and how can we cross tabulate with other uh, surveys. Mm -hmm. There was also uh, uh, a question regarding how uh, some of the, um, uh, how and if the uh, radar uh, coverage survey indicators will be incorporated in the future uh, into the accountability framework that we heard about uh, from uh, Dave Weber at, mm -hmm. at the beginning of the call. And I think I will pass over now to another group to share. Great, thank you, Melody. Um, we don't have any other volunteers. Maybe I can speak about my group quickly and then um, we can move on to, to closing this session out. Um, one of the things that came up in the discussion for us was about data sharing. Um, so as we're going through and, and carrying out all these coverage survey, all of these data are becoming, uh, are, are gathered, collected, um, and um, kind of a discussion about whether or not those data um, can be shared, if so, uh, what kind of authorizations are, are necessary. Um, kind of circling back, Melinda, to your first uh, point early on in the beginning, 
of trying to use the data that is there as opposed to um, always looking to collect our own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's um, really great and a good question and not something I think we, we have really addressed, um, uh, but perhaps something we, we should engage with. Okay, okay Melinda? Yes. Okay, uh, this is uh, uh, Maria. Uh, so we also have uh, uh, some discussions uh, uh, regarding experience uh, using uh, uh, radar tool or uh, coverage uh, server tools. And uh, uh, in our group, uh, uh, it's good to see that uh, there are some, uh, some uh, NGOs uh, who have experience uh, in implementing uh, uh, the full coverage uh, uh, steps, so baseline and the end line. So that was something uh, um, good to try to see uh, the impact uh, and also uh, the different outcome from uh, the interventions. So that, that was one uh, uh, one design, so baseline and end line. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, it also looked like so there are some NGOs uh, okay, uh, using various, various source of data, like uh, 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 Data shares uh, uh, data or uh, uh, health uh, uh, health management information system data. Okay, trying to put uh, all of those different sources of data uh, for uh, program intervention monitoring. That's just some things are uh, very interesting, and uh, uh, it's not of a standard way of uh, uh, the baseline and end line, but it looks like it's also it's an interesting. Uh, uh, experience uh, uh, people uh, also use uh, for monitoring uh, uh, the intervention. So, so this is uh, uh, some of the experience uh, people share with us uh, during uh, uh, these uh, breakout sessions. Okay. Thanks, Maiga. That's great. And it, it sounds like so a couple of groups have talked about sort of using different sources of data and how to, to triangulate those or, 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 or yeah. use them together. Um, and which I think is something that's covered a little bit in the online course, but we could think about how to how to address it further. Um, because we, we do really want to make sure that that if surveys are done, they get and, and other um, types of data collection are done, they get they get used fully. Um, okay, well, great. Um, and I, I hope these discussions were were useful to you all. Um, we'll, we will get full notes, I think, from all of the, the different groups and um, uh, use them to inform sort of continued development of these tools. Um, so just um, to, uh, to conclude, um, we wanted to uh, note that a Google survey will go out, I believe, by email. Um, Jessica can correct me if I'm wrong, um, to get feedback from you all on this session and on the tools more generally. Um, and so um, we ask you to, to please do respond to that, to that survey. Um, and um, also feel free to reach out to us uh, individually with comments or, or questions. Um, if there's things that, that uh, um, you, there's not room to, to put in the survey. Um, just a, also a reminder um, of the, uh, the upcoming workshops um, that we mentioned earlier. Um, so I think there, there has been a lot of interest um, in, uh, in the ODK questionnaires and the analysis and the gender analysis, um, um, also a little bit in the, uh, the sampling and sample size calculation. So um, really encourage you to participate in those webinars or have somebody from your organization participate. They will be more hands-on, um, so we will be um, asking you to sort of do things with the tools um, in order for us to see kind of how, how usable they are, in fact, for, for users. Um, and uh, it would be great to have you to have you on those. Um, so that is it from us. Um, you have uh, Talata's and my um, uh, email address is here. Uh, if you uh, would like to, to reach out and you also have the, uh, the website. So I want to now um, hand it back over to Jessica um, for any final um, remarks. No, I think you've covered it all, Melinda. So thank you uh, again, everybody, uh, for joining us uh, here uh, today. Um, as Melinda says, you'll get a, an email coming from me uh, with an invite to uh, fill out a, a survey 
uh, questionnaire um, uh, with feedback from uh, that you can provide feedback on today or questions that you would like to see uh, addressed in the upcoming uh, conversations. Um, so with that, a huge thank you to our friends at JJU, Melinda, Talata, um, I got everybody else. Um, of course, a huge thank you to my fellow can watchers here, Tina, uh, MIN, Fallon, and Melody. Um, and uh, I really look forward to seeing many of you uh, over the next uh, couple of weeks um, as we continue on with uh, learning about these uh, really interesting tools and, and their potential for helping us uh, understand uh, the impact that our programs are having. Uh, so wishing you all a great rest of your day um, and look forward to staying in touch via email. Thanks again.